Hello and welcome to Filling the Sink, a podcast from Catalan News. My name's Lorcan Doherty and today we're talking about Pablo Picasso. This Saturday, the 8th of April, marks 50 years since Picasso died in 1973, aged 91. A giant of 20th century art and culture, his anniversary has been marked by museums around the world, including here in Barcelona. Coming up today, Christina Tomas White and Kelly Shields take a trip to the city's Picasso Museum, itself celebrating its 60th anniversary. And we'll also be hearing from artist Maria Llopis on re-evaluating Picasso's life and work, especially in the context of his relationship with women. So I'm joined today by Christina and Killian. Hello to both of you. Hey, Lorcan. Hey, Lorcan. How's it going? Very well. I thought we could start, Killian, explaining Picasso's Catalan connection because he was born in Malaga. He spent most of his life in Paris. We're doing a Catalan news podcast, so why are we talking about him? Why are we talking about him? Yeah, no, exactly. Even though he didn't live here for most of his life, he's still intricately connected with Barcelona. He did live here for a good few years during his teens. His family moved around Spain. Uh, his dad was an art teacher, so got de- various different jobs. First in Malaga, then A Coruña in Galicia, and then over to Barcelona. And so, yeah, he spent a lot of formative years here in the city. So he was born in Malaga, 25th of October, 1881. His name uh, is worth reading out if we've got time. If we've got time, exactly. Deep breath. Pablo Diego José Francisco de Paula Juan Nepumeceno María de los Remedios Cipriano de la Santísima Trinidad Ruiz y Picasso. Well, Kelly, you know, hats off to you for that pronunciation. Got it in one. Got it in one. That was one take, folks. (laughs) Uh, Also known as Picasso. But um, (laughs) he he actually, he didn't settle on that name Picasso as his kind of artistic name right at the start. Because his first surname is Is Ruiz. Ruiz. Yeah, no. In fact, it was his friends here in Barcelona, his intellectual friends who told him, no, go go with Picasso. It's a little bit more original. More original. Stands out a bit more. So even though he didn't spend that much time here, you mentioned his intellectual friends. It was where he grew up in a sense. Do you Mm -hmm. know what? I mean, mm-hmm. he fell in with a bohemian crowd, artistic right. crowd. And, and even though he, he lived um, such a long time in France, his, his family stayed in Barcelona. So he always had that tie to Barcelona, those ties to Barcelona. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. The other place in Catalonia that he is connected to is a, a little town called Horta. Exactly. Horta de San Juan, all the way down in the southern tip of Catalonia. This really, really remote area, far from like the urban sprawls where Picasso really thrived in Paris and Barcelona. Um, He originally went there from Madrid, where he had been studying, because he was actually sick. And his friend, Catalan friend, Manuel Pallares, who was originally from the village, brought him there to help him recover. He spent some months there recovering, but also getting in touch with nature, you know, learning how to how to work the land, shear sheep, this well, kind of thing. Even the name itself, Horta, means like um, garden or whatever, yeah, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. vegetable mm. garden. Uh, yeah. And he said, I learned everything I know in Horta. So although he lived all his life in Paris, it, it was very formative time that, that he spent here in Catalonia. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Also up in the Pyrenees, Christina? Right, he spent some time in Gozu, this town in the Pyrenees, very small town, kind of like uh, Horta de San Juan, bit in remote. Um, and in fact, he signed some of his letters as Pau da Gozul, so Pau Pablo in Catalan from Gozul. He'd also signed some of his letters with Adeu, uh, bye, farewell in Catalan. So he picked up a bit of Catalan when he was yeah, here and apparently yeah. enjoyed Catalan poetry as well. Yeah, he's, he translated a couple of Vardagué's poems. Uh, Jacin Vardagué, who is a very big, important poet here, he attended his funeral too. So back in Barcelona, he lived this bohemian life. They hung about with artists, musicians, intellectuals. Uh, they used to frequent uh, all the cool cafes, some of which still exist today. Yeah, Els Quatre Gats. We were there just a week ago. It's still, still going. up and running. Quatre Gats, four cats, it's called. And that was all well and good for Picasso. But the center of the art world at the time was Paris, France. And uh, he made his first trip there in 1900 and decided to move there in 1904. So that's a little bit about Picasso, especially his early years. But what about his art, Killian? Yeah, I mean, he's probably most well known for the Cubism uh, movement that was particularly popular in the early part of the 20th century. Uh, This is like such a distinct kind of way of painting, isn't it? That sort of looks at all the different angles at the same time. It doesn't treat something as a regular 3D image, but uh, sort of shows all angles at the same time. Very avant-garde, even for now, I think it still stands up really well. But of course, Picasso is really well known for his blue period as well. This was earlier in his artistic career where he started painting in very somber tones uh, with subjects as well that would be particularly downbeat. So often you'd see paintings of uh, beggars or just a very sad old man playing a guitar, for example. Very, very sad tone to all of those 
paintings. Then that was followed by a, a slightly brighter period, the Rose period. Uh, but I, I think, as you said, Cubism is at least the kind of artistic movement that you would maybe most associate with Picasso and undoubtedly, as you say, has it, it looks so, you know, we're talking about, you know, he moved to France in 1904, 120 years ago, and it still looks kind of fresh when you see these works like, you know. Yeah, very original, very distinct. They really stand out, I think, in any, any gallery. Picasso ended up staying in France because after the Spanish Civil War and when Franco ruled Spain uh, in a dictatorship, uh, he basically wasn't able to return. Like many people, he was in exile. He, Picasso was... Also a communist. A communist, you know, is very much anti-Franco. He actually, he vowed to never return until Franco died. But unfortunately, he died two years before Franco did. So he never, he never came back to Barcelona or anywhere else in Spain. Unlike many artists, Picasso was very well known and very successful and famous in his own lifetime. So there was a movement in Barcelona to say, OK, well, let's open a museum. So we're going to hear now your trip to that very museum, which opened in 1963. But the interesting thing is, because Franco was still in charge, they couldn't say this is a Picasso museum. Mm-hmm. So it's actually named after his personal secretary. So it was called... Uh, Jaime Sabartes. Nowadays, it would be called Jaume Sabartes. In fact, the, the square right next to the museum is named after Jaume Sabartes. So that's the museum. You two went along uh, on a Monday. Mm-hmm. So uh, we're here. It was You had the place to yourself. Big, empty, spacious galleries. And you met up with Maria Choya. We're in the Picasso Museum here in Barcelona. It's just the two of us. Just us. Yeah, us and countless priceless pieces of art surrounding us. <laughs> We do eventually meet up with Maria Choya, the head of communications for the Barcelona Picasso Museum, who tells us about the artist as well as the 60-year history of the institution, which actually was first named after Picasso's personal secretary, Jaume Sabartes. He was not uh, believing in the dictatorship of of Franco. There couldn't be a Museo Picasso in in the 60s, in 1963, when the, the museum opened. There are a lot of Picasso's earlier works in the Barcelona Museum here, maybe not the ones that you would so much associate with him, a lot of the classic pieces that he had to put together as um, school projects. Yeah, like not in the Cubist style necessarily, but more in the classical style, so still life images as well. Uh, Communion. Communion, yeah, a lot of religious figures. Um, There's uh, another large painting of someone that's very sick in their bed, right. isn't it, as well? The perspective is kind of off. He's still getting his bearings as an artist. <laughs> but Yeah, but you can see he's, he's learning the trade, no? 80% of the collection is work of his uh, youth, his, when he was a, a teenager. So in order to understand how Picasso uh, became an artist, um, visitors have to come to the Picasso Museum of Barcelona. So right now we're looking at some of his paintings from the blue period. Right in front of us there's a woman with a bonnet who apparently, according to Maria, was a woman at a hospital in Paris who had syphilis, and that's why they made her wear a bonnet. They would distinguish who had what based on what they were wearing. It's interesting the things that you learn on the, the guided tour as well. But this is really interesting, this whole room that we're in with the many, many blue period paintings, lots of somber tones and... Lots of blues and dark greens and greys, especially. It's very after the death of his friend. Exactly, yeah, Carlos Casagemas. Um, that's said to have ushered in this blue period. So, yeah, it's definitely one of the standard things in this museum that you can you can get to see. The blue period was developed uh, in between Barcelona and, and, and Paris. So, very important is this collection that we that we own. So right now we're having a look at a big grey, black, grey, white uh, version of the Meninas. Yeah, Diego Velázquez's very, very well-known classical work from a few centuries before. Picasso was well-known to have done a study of this, um, which includes dozens of paintings of either the full version of Las Meninas or even individual figures that appear in it. Um, but this is very special because this museum has the entire collection. Uh-huh. Um, and yeah, it's, it's definitely one of the, for me, probably my favourite room of this museum. I kind of like the pigeon one better. The pigeon one's gorgeous. The pigeon, yeah, the colourful pigeons, um, which is technically part of the Meninas collection. He did it around the same time. 
but it's of pigeons, colorful pigeons. Very yeah. beautiful. This is what he did as, as basically uh, for respite. You know, he's working on a, a study of a classical painting, and that was obviously hard work. But the pigeons won, like, beautiful, it was gorgeous. It was actually, it was just something to relax. It's a very close second favorite room for me. <laughs> very important um, uh, collection of the series of Las Meninas. And that were painted in 1957, but Picasso decided to give them to the city of Barcelona uh, 10 years later. And it's a very important series because we see the whole series in one place, and this is uh, unique. He was a revolutionary, however, he never forgot the old masters. That's what makes him special. He was modern, he was new, he invented the modern language in painting, but he always had the old masters in mind. That was Maria Choya at the Picasso Museum here in Barcelona. Thanks very much to her. The museum here in Barcelona kind of focuses on a lot of his early works, he was a prolific artist, and if you walk into any major modern art museum around the world, you're probably going to you know, see some Picasso there. For example, uh, in New York, in MoMA, there's a very famous work of his, which Christine has our French speaker, I'm going to let you pronounce. <laughs> <laughs> Les Demoiselles d'Avignon, so the young ladies of Avignon, not to be confused with the city in France. It actually depicts uh, five nude women who worked as prostitutes at a brothel on Carre d'Avignon Street in Barcelona in the Gothic Quarter. So this is, yeah, so... It, French title, but it's actually based on his experiences in, in Barcelona. Barcelona. Yes, he, he was known to frequent brothels in the in the old quarter. Uh, this painting was uh, from 1907. It's in the MoMA in New York, and it's considered to be a part of his African period. Now it might be a bit frowned upon or considered cultural appropriation, but he did have a period in which he was inspired by African sculptures and masks and ancient Egyptian art, etc. Yeah, nowadays, especially as we're marking 50 years since he died, uh, there's kind of a reevaluation of those African influences and, you know, wh- where does influence become appropriation? And that's something that museums around the world, as they're curating exhibitions looking back, uh, are kind of addressing. There's another piece in uh, New York, actually, Killing the Caught Your Eye. Yes, indeed. Yeah, there's another one called Three Musicians. Uh, in fact, Picasso did two versions of this idea of a painting uh, featuring, believe it or not, three musicians, <laughs> uh, one playing a clarinet, another a guitar and another guy singing. And I just I just really like both of them, even though they're slightly different, but both of them has very jagged, almost like puzzle pieces that brings the whole image together. Yeah, really, it's a good example, I think, of the cubism, like really getting the essence of the image. Uh, you can picture it like a very dark, dingy jazz club, maybe in the be performing. I was going to say, yeah, when you, you can see, feel when it. you see it, you kind of think jazz, don't yeah. you? Like, you know, there's some, there's some kind of connection there. Absolutely. So, uh, uh, you can I, feel the music just by looking at the painting, which is, I think, a really cool thing about cubism. Like, it really gets the essence of it rather than just a surface a, a, a level stri- perspective. Yeah. Have you ever of it? considered becoming an art historian, Killian? Uh, I haven't. If the podcasting doesn't work out, <laughs> there you go. You're in good company in, in liking that one because my parents also have it up in their living room as well. So there there we go. go. One of Picasso's most famous works is undoubtedly Guernica, painted in 1937. It was a response to the bombing of the town Guernica, a market town in the Basque Country, which was bombed during the Spanish Civil War by Francoist forces and and their allies, Nazi Germans. An incredibly powerful work. Uh, enormous. Enormous. It's Just, it's on I, dis- think, I think the size of it's it really... It's in Madrid, right? Yeah, exactly. it's on display in the, in the Reina Sofia Museum in Madrid. And it's kind of in, in black and white and grey and very graphic in its agony depictions. in people's faces. And, and the horse. There's a yeah. horse on the side too. And you can see a lot of uh, deformed bodies as well suffering from the from the bombs. Probably one of the most famous kind of anti-war works of art. In, uh, For sure. Yeah. Yeah. 20th century. I've, I've, I've seen it in person a couple of times and just I, I repeat, like the size of it alone really takes your breath away, I think. And, lets you stir in the moment of, of, of this horror that you're looking at and yeah the size of it definitely adds something to it yeah it's three and a half meters tall and almost eight meters wide and anytime i've been to see it as well there always throngs of crowds uh there but i suppose one thing about it is it is big enough that you can kind of still get to appreciate it 
Picasso's artistic legacy is assured, undoubtedly. You know, he's one of the major, major figures of 20th century art. But as we are looking back 50 years on from his death, uh, it has to be said he is a very controversial figure too, uh, especially when it comes to his personal life. He treated women in his life very badly. He treated his family very badly. And there's kind of, I think, more and more conversation about this aspect of his life at the same time now, isn't there? Yeah, exactly. I mean, his own granddaughter, Marina Picasso, she published a book um, basically telling her story of, of growing up in the in the family that it was. It's called Picasso, My Grandfather. And in it, she just talks about how, how horrible basically family life was for her. She's the daughter of Picasso's son from his first wife. And she explains that basically that whole side of the family were completely ostracized. They were excluded from events. The whole family were blighted by alcoholism and suicide, unfortunately, in the decades since. Marina's father, Picasso's son, had to essentially beg him for money. He was so forgotten about, uh, neglected. They were excluded from Picasso's 88th birthday. And as a response to this, Marina's brother ended up drinking bleach. And unfortunately, after suffering for months, ended up dying because of this, age 24. And so Marina is now selling off all of the inheritance that she, she's been given. She's described it as an inheritance without love. She has written before that she doesn't even like to look at the paintings. To her, they're absolutely meaningless. But she's using it just to fund humanitarian projects that she's a part of and trying to turn what she was given to her as, a, as an awful thing, what she regards, trying to put some good from it. So making money from it, but then bring it into humanitarian projects and other charity work. There's actually a quote from Marina's book where she talks about uh, Picasso's relationship to women in general as well, uh, especially the woman that uh, his so-called muses, these these women, often artists uh, who he was in relationship with. So Marina said he submitted them to his animal sexuality, tamed them, bewitched them, ingested them and crushed them onto his canvas. To find out more about this aspect of Picasso... Killian, you spoke to the artist, writer, feminist activist Maria Lopez about how we should deal with this side of Picasso today. The world is already well aware of the brilliance of Pablo Picasso. Yet in more recent years, and against the backdrop of a survivor-led global movement against sexual violence and abusive behaviour in general, many have started to re-evaluate the figure of the universally recognised genius. He was a women abuser. He had super toxic relationships with, with the women in his life. It's long been well known that the world-famous Cubist painter was something of a womanizer in his day, marrying twice and having many other relationships over the course of his life. But the way he would treat these women is coming under fresh examination in light of what we know today. Maria Yopis is an artist, writer, activist and feminist, and in 2021 she and some of her students made headlines for a protest action that they carried out in Barcelona's Picasso Museum. My students were very interested in the figure of Dora Mar. We put these t-shirts on, no? uh, saying Picasso, women abuser, Dora Mar presente, like bringing the name of, of the women artists who, who were with him and could not develop their art practice, and stating what he had done. And we just walked around the museum with the t-shirts on. Why? Because Dora Mar, she was a well-known photo, surrealist photographer in Paris. In her, th- in her she was 30 years old, and and she had an amazing uh, uh, work. And she was a uh, well-known, and she had a reputation. And then she started a relationship with Picasso, and again he was uh, much older than her. And what happened with her artwork? It shrink, like her life and her creativity uh, shrink. It's super sad and my students started to investi- uh, investigate a little bit, no? And and it's so easy to find it's like everywhere, no, that they had a had a toxic relationship and she was Picasso beat her up till she fainted that, that is, till she was in the in the floor and she was picked up by people by the chauffeur. 
when it's everywhere it's in every bi biography it's not something but it's true that uh, like uh, the media sells this image of Picasso as like the great artist and Picasso had a great work uh, uh, nothing 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 to say against his his work but we tend to to idealize uh, just one figure Maria Yopis is clear that she's against cancel culture, but she believes that no information about such a figure should be hidden. That's a fact. I mean, he was an abuser and, and he did an amazing work. His artwork changed the the European art scene of the moment, and that's and that happened, and that was it. I don't think we should burn uh, Picasso's artwork. My aim is on the contrary, is I want more artworks to be there in the world, not less. I don't want any more women uh, to stop their life force, their, their creativity, because of starting an abusive, an abusive relationship. So how should we look back at a figure such as Pablo Picasso, given what we know about him now? I think it would be super interesting to look back in the figure of Picasso by looking at these portraits of uh, crying women that he has. Like, for example, in, in the Museo Nacional Reina Sofia in Madrid, you can see the Guernica. It takes so much attention. But then in your back, if you turn around, there are five portraits of women crying. And these are portraits of abused women. I think it would be very interesting to take the information out of these portraits no? and talk about abusive relationships, about toxic relationships between men and women through these portraits of Picasso. I think that would be a nice exercise. That was Maria Lupis, our thanks to her. MariaLupis.com, if you want to find out more about her work. Uh, Maria is spelled how you imagine. And Lupis is L-L-O-P-I-S. Picasso's anniversary is not the only major one happening this year that's being celebrated in Catalonia and in Barcelona in particular. Joan Miró died 40 years ago this year and the two big museums kind of honouring those two painters, so the Fundación Joan Miró and the Museo Picasso, they've kind of come together to put on a joint exhibition which is going to be one of the artistic highlights of, of the year undoubtedly. It starts in October, the 19th of October and runs into next year, 25th of February. The Barcelona Design Museum also has a, an exhibition, Christina. Yes, it will. From June to September 2023, it will have an exhibition of 16 ceramic pieces that inspired Picasso. Um, these were previously at the Palais Miramar in Cannes, in the south of France. Picasso is known to have had an interest in 13th century Spanish ceramics and is in fact quoted as having said, how is it possible that they did this before me? Ah, typical <laughs> egocentric artist, no? Right, right, right. <laughs> right. Um, so that's on in the Barcelona Design Museum from June to September. So these pieces that inspired Picasso. Horta de San Juan, this little town in Terra Alta in the south of Catalonia, up in the mountains, where Picasso spent some time. They have a, a Picasso museum there too, a Picasso center. And even out and about in Barcelona, Killian, you can see some Picasso. You can indeed, yeah, if you go to the Barcelona Cathedral, right in the middle of the city centre. Uh, and if you turn around, you can see an enormous open-air fresco created by Picasso on a, on a wall. And it sort of depicts people and animals and what looks like a king and queen as well. And well, so it's an interesting one. It's, it's, it's one that maybe you've walked past and not realised you're walking past a Picasso work. There you go. And it's not too far from the Picasso Museum. We heard you two visited there earlier, but it's actually, I mean, it's in a lovely part of Barcelona and mm -hmm. it's a lovely building as well. It's worth a visit, isn't it? Ah, it's fantastic, yeah. Especially for his early works. It's, uh, it's really cool to see kind of Picasso growing up, you know, learning the trade. Time now for our Catalan phrase. What do we got this week, Christina? Quatre gats. Quatre gats, four cats. Mm -hmm. which, which obviously is the name of the cafe that uh, Picasso up, yeah. and the other intellectuals frequented. Patricio and those guys. What does it actually mean? So it's, it's what you say when there are not a lot of people. So if you go somewhere, I mean, Killian, you know, you know what we're talking about. Like if you go to a, if you go cover an event and there are more journalists than the actual participants, you say, oh, no me bien cuatro gats. There are exactly. only four cats. Yeah. <laughs> There's only four cats, <laughs> or if right? The protest was a dud. <laughs> well, yeah, only four cats. So hardly anyone there at all. Yeah. Cuatro gats. That's all for today. Thanks very much for tuning in. Our email address is filmthesync at acn.cat if you want to get in touch with us. 
Thanks very much to the two Marias we heard from Maria Choya at uh, the Picasso Museum here in Barcelona and the artist Maria Llopis. Thanks very much, Christina and Killian. Good to see you. Thanks very much for having us. We're back next weekend with another episode of Filling the Sink. Until then, for me, Lorcan Doherty, and all of us here at Catalan News, enjoy the Easter Bank holiday. Bye for now. Adieu.